Today's lecture is about generators in nuclear medicine, one of my favorite topics as well as the area in which I do research. The contents will be the introduction of chromatography, maybe what can go wrong with generators, and for this here I have included some other generators and not just only the molybdenum 99 and then also some future ones that would be hopefully in the nuclear medicine clinic in the future. Why generators? I think this is really straightforward. Short half-lives, uh, radionuclides with short half-lives can then be available on site, on tap as needed. It is sometimes the cheaper option and it can also allow access to radionuclides in facilities that are geographically further away from cyclotrons or where having a cyclotron is not feasible at this stage. The ideal generator should yield a useful daughter radionuclide of course as well as the chemistry should be useful. Um, if we look at the uh, rubidium 82 coming from a generator then that's not really an isotope that we can do a lot with although it has its uses uh, for myocardial perfusion other than that we cannot really do a lot with it chemistry wise so of course this also influences how ideal a generator is or not it should be physiological acceptable and all of those normal things be easy to store safe to use easy to ship and then finally, it should give a high yield of the daughter, have low contamination of the parent isotope, give high specific activity or concentration of the daughter radionuclide, and not re lead to any leaching of the column material. The principles of chromat chromatography is really important to understand how a generator works. So chromatography is a method where you use a fixed phase and a solvent to separate different components that is mixed together. And I really like this uh, website with the explanation and I copied this picture from there, but please go and have a look at this link where the different components stick with a different affinity to the stationary phase or dissolve in a better way into the solvent phase or have a higher affinity for the solvent and as it travels through it separates. So it's about the lipophilicity, hydrophilicity, the charge of the components and how much each like the two different components compared to one another. So the higher the absorption or sticking onto the stationary phase, the slower the molecule will move through the column. The higher the solubility in the mobile phase or affinity for that, the faster the molecule will move through the column. So a generator system then use this where a parent and a daughter isotope have different affinities for the column and the solvent. Then you load up the parent and you push the solvent through all the time and then you can take it off the column. So the chemistry of the parent and the daughter should be different. The parent is in a high amount put on this material or solid phase. And this most often than not uses like the charge of these molecules, positive or negative ions, or maybe more positive than one another, um, and a charge solid phase. So the um, column material will maybe have a, a negative phase and a minus one, and then the parent isotope would be maybe a, a plus two, and then the daughter isotope decays off as a plus one. And then the plus one has less affinity for, for the opposite phase. So the solution or the mobile phase is passed through and this is called the irrelevant. And based on this charge difference, the parent will stick more stronger to the column than the daughter isotope. It's important to note that the parent decays at the steady time. So depending on how this half-life is for the parent, this will allow you to yield uh, to elute at different time points. So if you look at this picture, it's a radioactive decay of molybdenum and the build up of the daughter technetium 99M within 24 hours of their elution. So there's no rule that says you cannot elute the generator more times a day, but the preferred time for a molybdenum generator is 24 hours because then it reaches 
the highest amount that you can get from the generator you can elude everything off and then it builds up again but for sure you can elude at four hours or six hours or even 12 hours generally the rule of thumb for technetium generators is to not elude uh, so if you elude every day at seven o'clock in the morning you should try to not elude it after 12 o'clock in the afternoon and because if you elude later during the day it will really influence your yield the following day but then again if you have less work booked for the next day and you really need to elude later then of course that's always an option so you should understand the physics behind it and calculate how much activity you can get the next day and so forth so sometimes you really need to elude a technician generator even three times a day that you can do but the most optimal times is at time zero and then again at time 24 hours the reasons for generator malfunction is when it's not used according to the manufacturer's instructions so if you have a dry generator that is wet it will not work very well if a wet generator is dry it will not work very well. So a dry generator is typically like the molybdenum 99 generator where you pull out all the eluent afterwards and you keep the generator dry. If you, you have it wet and you haven't performed this procedure correctly, it will malfunction. If a wet generator like your gallium generator, um, your germanium 68 generator is, is dry when you should keep it wet all the time, then it will also malfunction. If the element is wrong, and there is, uh, so say you are eluding a germanium 68 generator and there's some me metal contamination in your element or the acidic concentration is not correctly or you try to elute your technetium generator with water instead of saline, all of this will lead to poor malfunction. If there is uh, air or void spaces in this um, process when you elude so say you're supposed to push through five milliliters of saline but there is some um, maybe four milliliters of saline and one milliliter of air in the business it would also influence the generator malfunction if the rate of elution is not optimal so every generator should be eluted at a certain speed or if the time since the previous elution is not optimal that's uh, say 24 hours but you elude only at five hours then you would of course get less activity some ethanol contamination in the molybdenum 99 generator so if you clean for sterility purposes but do not let it dry or if there is a manufacturing fault i think that's a spelling error my mistake but if some of the color material leaks out and so on then that's also problematic so the first generator we look at is the technetium 99m generator most often used more than 80 percent of procedures worldwide so you have your parent molybdenum 99 isotope that decays with a 65.9 hour half-life to technetium 99 metastable that has a 6 hour half-life to technetium ground state. It is having some late shielding, making the ideal shielding of course. It has a vacuum vial, so you use this vacuum as the pressure to pull through your eluent from your saline vial. So you always need to correct it the right, uh, connect it the right way. You have filters to maintain sterility, glass filters to stop the alumina coming out. Alumina is at minus two, and your molybdenum 99 is also at a minus, uh, a plus two charge, and you will see your technetium only plus one. So the molybdenum 99 plus 2 really likes to be on the alumina column with minus 2. The production of molybdenum can happen in two ways, mostly reactor based. We will not discuss cyclotron production of molybdenum 99 or technetium 99M at this stage since it's not general practice but some research is going on in that area. So you get your uranium-253 that is bombarded with neutrons, make fission, and then you get all sorts of radioactivity out of there, of which one of the radionuclides you get is molybdenum-99. You also have molybdenum-89, which is the ground state of molybdenum that you can put into the reactor and bombard it, and then 
you get molybdenum 99. The best way is for nuclear fission. It has the highest activity, which results in better um, behaving generators. Currently, all molybdenum generators is dry. You have a dry uh, vacuum vial, you put saline in, you pull it through, you count five minutes until all the vacuum is used up. So you should make sure all of the saline is removed out of your generator and then you do QC on your Technetium 99M element. Generally, it's the best to put on your vacuum vial, then connect your saline, let it pull through all the saline and then wait another additional five minutes to make sure it's dry. If you have problems with your generator, most often it will be solved also by just putting another vacuum vial on and drying it again. Quality control of Technetium 99M. You can do instant fin layer tom tomography where you um, spot your protectinitate on the bottom and you let it run. And then you should see um, that there is no colloids or it should be all free protectinitate. Um, the easiest um, solvent that you can use is just saline with an ITL CSG plate because free protectinitate will go to the top and colloids will stay at the bottom. Visual inspection always important, of course taking the safest precautions not to stare directly at the radioactivity but behind lead shielding. Always measure your radioactive yield as well as the amount of milliliters you've pulled through the generator. You should know what to expect to get and your yield should be close. You can test pH. Aluminum breakthrough is really important and then also molybdenum breakthrough. This is a test that you can do. Um, I have another lecture on this channel um, that was a SAS in a meeting recording and a lot of these um, technicalities are also discussed there and some things that can go wrong. So that should also be of interest for you if you're interested in the day-to-day -day, um, labeling of technetium. And then there's also another technetium labeling um, video as well as one about just the production of these generators. This is the molybdenum 99 breakthrough test. So it's based on um, taking the Eluid, shielding it so that only the molybdenum-99 activity gets picked up by your dose calibrator. So it should be 0.6 cm lead to allow 740 to 7 and 780 keV to go through the emissions, but the 140 keV of the technetium stays inside and is blocked by the lead. And then thereafter you measure the Eluid just as it is in the technetium channel and then you calculate. You should know how to calculate this um, and then what is the standards that your facility wants to adhere to. The United States Pharmacopoeia is a bit less strict than the European Pharmacopoeia. Chemical purity assessment is important for the first Eluid of your generator. It is a semi-quantitative, so you have uh, alumina in certain concentrations that you spot on your strip. It's a color strip. And then you put your sample in and then you can gouge how much alumina is in this um, element of yours. There is a summary of the quality control of Technetium 99M element that you can pause and read through. You should know how to do all these tests and also when to do it. This is just a summary of how to label with technetium. I'm not going to go into depth because there is other radio labeling videos on this channel. But technetate Eluid um, is technetium minus. It's in the coordination state of seven. So this is chemically unuseful, but then the chemistry of technetium is beautiful because you can do some reduction with tin, put it in all seven of the coordination states and then label it with a various amount of different radiopharmaceutical vectors. So it's really very easy chemistry. Note that the quality of the element is important. You should not add air or water or all of these things. So there's a lot that can go wrong. You should know how to work with technetium if you want to do it. So the question would be, is molybdenum 99 the generator, the ideal one? I would say it's very close to ideal. And it's a testament for how far it has come in nuclear medicine and how important it is.
The next one is gallium 68. I will also later add multiple slides on gallium 68 since I'm soon going to present a lecture series in Uman in October on gallium 68 technicalities. So watch out for more videos. So the parent isotope is germanium-68, 270.9 day half-life. And um, this is very useful because it can have a generator that stands on the shelf for up to a year in some cases. Then it decays to gallium-68, the daughter isotope with a 68 minute half-life. So all the current modern generators provide gallium-3 plus ions and you should make sure that it has the correct pH so that you have your gallium um, that is useful. So we normally label gallium at 3.5 to 5 but there is a lot of generator, uh, sorry, chelators that has been developed to make it a bit better so that you can even label a bit higher the pH but you should normally label at a acidic pH for it to be in the correct chemical form for labeling. Then it's important also to know that you get the gallium out of the generator in a very acidic solution. So normally you make it less acidic before you label and then finally when the radio labeling is done you have to buffer it to a pH of 7. The generator kinetics is really useful. So typically in the clinic, you can even elute your generator every three hours. There's quite a high buildup of the daughter and a really high load of the parent isotope on this generator system. So yes, it's a very long half-life for the parent isotope, but the generators are so designed that you can elute this generator three at, well up to three times a day. So the labeling process is um, you can either get gallium, of course, also from a cyclotron production, which is also a really well developed method, or you can get it from the generator. You um, then have to post purify your illusion um, because there is a problem with metal contamination. Gallium is a, a metal, so any metal contamination in your mixture will influence your radio labeling. Then you um, have your reaction mixture with certain conditions and then you can also finally purify your product before you give it to a patient. Gallium labeling is not as well developed as technetium labeling, so it's not really just having a kit, adding the gallium and then you're ready to go after QC. There is multiple factors, but some kit valves have been developed, also automated processes, and of course you always have to take into account also the radiation protection because the PET isotopes really have a higher radiation um, constraint. Impurities in the aloet can have quite a detrimental effect. And also, again, if you um, have your generator stand for a long time without eluting, just as the technetium generator, who ha which has a built up of ground state technetium, which is not useful, the germanium generator decays to gallium and then to um, zinc. And this is also not a useful metal for what we want to do. So when it builds up, it influences your radio labeling. It's not radioactive and it really makes that your radiochemical purity goes down to an unacceptable level. So you should always adhere to the manufacturing instructions and first elute your generator. If it has stand for one or two days, you have to elute it before you have the next illusion that is useful for hospital, I uh, sorry, for radiopharmaceutical production. Okay. Also, you have to check for germanium breakthrough. So there is purification methods of the eluidine. If you want to make sure that all the germanium is out of it, as well as all of the or unnecessary metals, um, you have anionic, cationic and fractionation. I will not go into depth in these methods, we will also discuss it in the future, but fractionation is not a chemical purification method, but rather you taking the highest concentration of gallium from your eluid and just using that one milliliter with the hope of all the other impurities then not being there. Your cationic, of course, um, has gallium in a positive ion mode, 
and therefore your other metal ions will go through but your gallium free plus will stay and your anionic changes gallium through the use of hydrochloric acid to a negative salt with a charge and then your other metal impurities goes through so all of these remove the parent unwanted parent uh, radionuclide out of the system and also your metal impurities that can influence your radio labeling this is just all the current available generators some of them are gmp some of them are not the acidic concentrations that you use to elude them all are different they can all be given in different radioactive quantities and then they also have different shelf lives so this is also really interesting to note that there is quite a few generators available and they all have their different constraints and your radio labeling method has to be adapted for each generator then just a note on how the generators look and i have used the itimba labs generator as an example lead shielding the column loaded with the germanium 4 plus glass filter and you push the hydrochloric acid through and your gallium 3 plus comes out of your generator so you can either push it through or pull it through and then you get your element out as gallium chloride Then you always have to do germanium breakthrough testing of the parent isotope. There is three different ways. I cannot stress it enough if you work with gallium generators that you should constantly monitor for germanium breakthrough. Unfortunately, it's not so easy as the molybdenum breakthrough of the technetium 99M generator because you are dealing with a shorter half-life, less easy parent isotope to measure so often you only measure the next day or the day thereafter so you keep your left hour activity and measure it after two days so that means you have to measure all your eluids or your manufactured radio pharmaceuticals and constantly monitor the behavior of the generator and then if you see anything wrong you should act so you can measure it on a gamma spectrometer it's not really every radio pharmacy that has this equipment. Method 2 is the most often used, where you measure the amount of gallium on day 1, leave it for 48 hours, and then you measure again, and then you calculate the percentage. And there's also ITLC strip that is explained into this um, reference. Other regular QC that you should do is always elution efficiency. So the moment you elute for either radio labeling or just general maintenance of the generator, you should see how much activity you got and see if it correlates with the amount expected. You should also check that the amount of fluid you push through that you also get that out. But remember the column is always wet and then and should stay wet. You should check the pH of the eluid and also do visual inspection. There is different production methods that you can use, all depending on your environment and your facility. This will be part of my lecture series coming later this year. But there is vials available on the market for kit-like production. There is semi-automation and then also full automation, which is of course the ideal. Just as a quick introduction to the basic steps for the synthesis of gallium PSMA for instance for prostate specific membrane antigen imaging is you elute the generator you do your purification or concentration process either anionic cationic or fractionation you add it to the vial with your peptide or peptidomimetic in your, your radio pharmaceutical of choice you buffer it to four and a half, you incubate it at room temperature for 10 minutes at or at 95 degrees if you want. And then there's possibly post purification involved. And then you have to buffer it again to final pH for patient use at seven and do quality control. This is just all the factors of the chemistry again. And this will also be in the chemistry lecture. You have your eluid. Like we said, you buffer it. It gets incorporated into this part of your radio pharmaceutical, which is called a chelator, which is sort of a cage that traps your gallium inside. If you have the wrong pH, you form these radio 
active colloids, gallium colloids, little crystals that doesn't dissolve and is not useful if injected into the patient, it accumulates in the liver. If you have too little chelator, you can get free gallium, of course. You eat it up. If you don't do it enough, the kinetics is as such that you will not get a good labeling and either free gallium or colloids will form. And then you have your extremely stable radio pharmaceutical that you can inject after labeling. And there's also purification methods available that's very simple to use. So on the front of generators, what else can we expect? In uh, maybe less often used generator is the rubidium 81 and krypton 81 metastable generator, which yields krypton 81 metastable with a half-life of 13.1 seconds. Not useful for chemistry, but extremely useful for ventilation imaging. So you ventilate the patient with a system that's already designed and you have a quick imaging and it's the ideal because it's a gas. So it is really equal to the actual flow of gas in the lungs. So this is like the most optimum ventilation agent that you can get. You get rubidium 82 for PET imaging. Also a very short half-life. It has a 75 seconds half-life and it's for perfusion and you have this whole system which you link up to the patient and you do PET imaging with that, but it gives really good images and they also manage to put it on a truck. So you have your generator on your truck, your, your rubidium generator coupled to your PET camera and then you can go to remote locations. Just for this is nice to know, <laughs> not I think something that you would see very often in your day-to-day -day practice. Then the tungsten 188, rhenium 188 generator is, is one of the ones of my favorite, basically, which I do research on. We don't have, uh, like, for gallium or the therapeutic radionuclides yet, really pep peptides or larger molecule therapeutics, but there is a lot of therapeutics developed, um, a skin cancer cream, uh, lipoidal for liver cancer, also um, colloids for arthritis and so forth. So it has been really useful and um, this generator is also nearly ideal as the technetium one. Same chemistry basically and it's very useful. There is this Ancubita system, it's really nice where you have your a radioactive ampules that um, is produced by a site that has a generator. You plug it in the system and you can apply radioactive cream to patients with, with the correct type of skin cancer for the application. Actinium-225 as the parent isotope, eluting into bismuth-213 is also a research generator that's being investigated for alpha therapy. It could be interesting in the future, so it's nice to also take note of this. And then radium 224 lead 212, also a lot of work is being done. It's really a very easy, simple generator in a way, but also very tricky, I think, to incorporate into clinical use. So basically the radium 224 is um, made a gas. It is um, decaying and then it's getting stuck on the glass and then you just wash off the lead 212 from the glass and you use that for radio labeling. Quite an interesting principle of which you can also go and read some more. So the conclusion is that you should know your generator and understand the chemistry behind the generators and also know chromatography so that if you have any troubles with this you know how to solve it in the clinic. This lecture will also die into many more to come, so thank you for your attention.